I'm Ben, this is Harm, and we're here to present uh, new hot root planning technology and that we hope will interest you all. Um, so I'm Ben, I'm part of OpenStreetMap Belgium, also part of the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, uh, but I'm also part of the Open Planner team, um, and that team is a public, is a partnership between some private companies, among which anyways my company, and the University of Ghent, where Harm works. Um, so I will be presenting the first part of this presentation, Harm will do the second one. So, um, what is this about? So if most root planners out there do the same work over and over and over again, so you have it's, it's not the open source projects in itself, but even all of the root planning instances out there pre-process the same data over and over again, the same, uh, the same road network, the same public transport schedules, all over, all over, every time again. So does it make sense to share the result? Yeah, we think, of course, yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So I will explain a little bit about uh, linked data and, and how we published the OpenStreetMap network um, in, in a new way. Uh, and then Harm will present the actual work that was done um, uh, in the second part where the interesting stuff is happening. So basically, uh, linked geospatial data. So I think in the OpenStreetMap community, we don't really think about this way of publishing the OpenStreetMap network. And I think we should think about this a little bit more. Um, it, it makes sense to publish data like this, basically generate the URI for everything, link all the things together, it's great. So we should do this. Um, <clears throat> so what did we actually do? So we, we made linked data fragments for the OpenStreetMap planet. So what does this mean? So you have on, on the left side, or is it, yeah, on the left side, you have a data dump. So this basically means you publish the whole data set in one uh, in one go, you compare this to the planet file you have, uh, the planet OSM file. Or on the right, you have a, a service that, that you can query. You don't publish any data, you just ask the server for information. Compare this to overpass or uh, something like that. Um, so um, what did we do? So we used the uh, OpenStreetMap as linked data fragments, so we used the tiling system. Uh, we made a decent ontology for the tags. Uh, we figured out how to publish this and make it like for the whole planet. It was uh, pretty challenging in itself. Uh, and we published this as uh, JSON-LD data. Uh, currently, we don't update this uh, live, but the idea is to keep updating this data along with the OSM live stream uh, changes. Uh, so why are we doing this? Um, basically, on the left, you see a classic root, root planning service. So you see the little red thingy there. It means the server is doing a lot of work. So all the clients asking roots, asking roots, and the only one doing work is the server. So we want to share the load between uh, server and client. So basically, what we have done now is reduce the server to just the service publishing data, and the clients will do the root planning. So there are a few trade-offs. I think Harm will also discuss this shortly, I don't know. Um, but one of them is, for example, privacy. The server will never know uh, origin and destination. It will only know what area you downloaded. Um, also, it gets, the client can configure routing profiles, for example. So the routing profile is very, possibly very dynamic. Um, yeah, so can we do this? Yes, we can. But currently, it's slow. Um, of course, um, if, if, you, if you know about root planning and you, you hear about this idea, the first thing you do is think, oh, well, this is crazy, it will never work. Um, but Harem will show you in a second that it is possible. Um, currently, it also downloads a lot of data. So, um, yeah, so Harem is going to talk about this in the next steps. So, um, yeah, go Harem. Okay. <coughs> this work? Okay, perfect. Um, Okay, let's just capture the cursor as well. What is this? Okay, so what we're going to try to do is going to add some pre-processing to the rootable tiles so that you're not only working on the raw data, you're going to add some yeah, pre-computations to make it easier for the client to ingest the, the, yeah, to, to ingest the data. So going back to the spectrum we saw earlier, going to move a bit further away from the data dumps, a bit closer to the full-fledged root planning service, uh, but essentially we're still going to publish data. Um, and the idea is, 
most route planners do something similar, right? Most route planners already do a pre-processing step um, to make the, the query time uh, performance way better. Um, so yeah, why should we? Makes sense, of course. Um, so one of the first things we did, uh, we noticed that pedestrian areas are pretty hard to use, yeah, in general. Uh, usually these are defined as um, polygon areas. Basically only the edges are defined in OpenStreetMap, uh, which is fine because you know the information is there, but just the root planners, it's pretty hard to actually use that information. Um, so what we try to do is materialize the information that's already in there. Um, and yeah, the idea is very simple. So basically you just create like a visibility graph inside of a polygon. You're just gonna generate all the edges that lie on the interior of the polygon. So basically, th this defines that you can walk from this edge to this edge without leaving the polygon. So basically, yeah, that's what a pedestrian area is. Um, and that's, that's how you get the image up top, which you, you barely see the lines anymore. There are so many lines, it's just a, a, a yellow blob. There's so much data, if you would publish this, it would become even slower. Uh, so of course, you have to <laughs> work around this. Uh, and, and, the, and the solution is pretty simple or straightforward. Uh, it, we basically do a lot of one-to-many data star queries in the area around it. And we basically see, yeah, well, what this tells us is that we, which of those yellow edges are actually used by a route planner. So we, we, this is it's probably a bit of a brute force approach, but it actually works. Um, because, yeah, that's literally how a route planner works. Um, and as reasonable as this is, we are definitely not the first to try this. And th this is why we, our, our second slide was a lot of us are doing the same pre computations over and over again. And, and, and it seems strange because we're all handling the same data in the same way to do the same thing. And so this is an example from uh, the Open Trip Planner, which is, I think is, at least from what I can tell, the only other route planner that does the same thing as I just explained, um, but they do it way better for what it's worth. Um, they also put a lot more work in it. Uh, but then it, what, I was, what I'm getting at is that, like the second column is like the, the comments they have on their, their configuration page, and they say like, these calculations can be time consuming. So, so why do we keep repeating the same stuff over and over again, right? You could, if you can just publish the, the results of the pre-processing, everyone can just ingest the results and then everyone is happier. Uh, that's just an aside, we'll get back to this eventually. Continuing with our own pre-processing to make our own stuff faster for now. Uh, we also noticed something else, that if you just download the raw data, you're basically downloading way too much data, which makes sense, of course, because it has. If, if, if you don't download the data you need, you're back to the, yeah, the full-fledged root planning service. Um, but essentially, if, if you're trying to plan a 100-kilometer journey, you're probably not interested in all the dead-end streets in the middle of your journey, because yeah, why would you go there? It's, it's a dead end. Um, so we, we apply the same principle to the routable tiles. We basically notice that if, you're, if you don't have to be in one specific tile, if it's just a tile you're passing through, you're not really interested in all the data that's in there. You're only interested in, in, in what ways do I need to get from one point or from one edge of the tile to the other edge of the tile. Um, so yeah, same principle as, as the pedestrian areas, a lot of one-to-many data star queries from one edge of the tile to another, and eventually we see which ways are actually needed, and then we publish those separately as like a, a derived version of the, the routable tiles. Uh, and this is an example of uh, downtown center of Antwerp. And you can see all the red stuff is being discarded and the red stuff here in the, here in the middle is the zoo, for example. Because why would you need the zoo data if you're just you know, driving your car? Um, so this is pretty cool. And it's, like, it reduces the, the effective uh, file size by about 40%. So that's already a great start. But the cool thing is, if this works, yes, perfect. Uh, so we, we fragmented the data similar to all other OpenStreetMap data. Basically, we have the, the XYZ style system. Uh, so we have zoom levels, of course. And the higher the zoom level is, the more, this the more effective this reduction becomes. So for example, this is uh, the area around Lille uh, in, in France. Uh, this, this is pretty significant, uh, pretty large area, pretty densely populated as well. It's 570 square kilometers. Uh, which is the size of one zoom level 10 tile in that area. Um, and basically, if, if we try, try to uh, express the same region using zoom level 11 transit tiles, uh, we need 7.1 megabytes of uncompressed data. This is already pretty decent, right? Because it's already transit tiles, so it's already reduced several steps. 
Um, but basically, the difference from going, the difference in, in from, uh, the difference in going from a level 11 zoom level to a zoom level 10 is another 40 percent, and this is like incremental improvements. If you would go to like to like a zoom level 8, for example, this star, this, this region would be expressed in like 800 kilobytes, I think, and that's before compression, like gzip. So this is already this this is becoming. This is becoming useful. This is becoming like a practical file size. But there is more. Um, so it's not only we're not always. Yeah, it's not only the, the roads that are not always useful. A lot of the nodes and OSM aren't useful for root planners either. Like a lot of them are only there to, to de define the shape of a road. But if a root planner doesn't care about that, it's also it would make sense to not publish that data as well. Um, so that's what we did as well. We, we basically do a contraction of that node. So basically, we're going to replace a node. Yeah, we're just going to get rid of a node and then publish the, the distances between the leftover nodes. And the, the nodes we're going to retain are all the well, the nodes that I think would be most interesting for a risk planner. For example, the, uh, the beginning and, and the end of the street, uh, intersections, uh, pedestrian crossings, traffic lights, stuff like that. Uh, and in the end, this reduces the file size by another 40%. So yeah, the, the same 570 square kilometers uh, region I was talking about in the previous slides is now only two megabytes before compression. And this is becoming really, yeah, this is becoming way more practical. Um, and just to prove that it is, let us go to the next section is about how do we use this pre-processed data in a root planner or an, a, any root planner, it doesn't have to be this one, of course. Um, so this is, yeah, I have to be honest, I, I've only pre-processed like this bounding box around Belgium, so I'm gonna have to limit myself to that. Like, let's say, for example, if you wanna go from, I'm gonna give an example or later of Brussels to Bruges. This is about 100 kilometers in distance. Um, so this is my computer, so this is all live. I'm glad it works. <laughs> So, so you, you can see it's dynamically downloading more data as it goes. Each time it gets to the edge of, a, of a, one of the tiles that already downloaded, it's, it's a basic data implementation. We, we kept it simple for now. Um, and each time it gets to uh, the edge of one of the tiles that already has, it's going to fetch the next tile. And as you can see, it's, it's always going to fetch larger and larger tiles. That's because, the, because of the way that the transit tiles were defined, right? If you don't have to be there, you can throw away a lot of stuff. So basically, it's going to fetch the largest possible tile that doesn't include the begin and end location. And that's why you get like this, this weird bottom-up quad tree structure, which is really fun to watch. Um, and of course, yeah, like Ben already said, and at no point did this client leak to the server where it's going or what it's trying to do. Or, um, in fact, if, if the client already had the data cached somewhere, the server wouldn't even know which region you were trying to go to. So these are all interesting benefits um, yeah of course yeah and, and, and as you can see it's it's still s significantly slower than most root planners most people are using but, but it's getting there right it's, it's, it's close to being close to being good enough for actual usage I think um, let's see how much timey ah, Jesus there's yeah that's the, the downside of web slides there's like a massive SVG on the next slide not sure if it's trying. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> okay, I, I might have to. Might also be frozen. That's also nice. No, nope, just just got to brute force this. Got to skip that slide. Next slide. Perfect. <laughs> I was going to skip it anyway. It's fine. Okay. So the the overall impact on query times. So th this is the same example as I just gave in the live demo. Uh, Brussels Airport to Bruges. Well, more or less. It's more or less one, exactly 100 kilometers, depending on where you click. Um, using the raw data, th this, this requires about 215 uh, megabytes of, of transfer data. So this is compressed GZIP data. That's, that's a lot of data. If you have to squeeze that into a client, especially if that client is like a, a mobile phone or something, it becomes really impractical. And that's probably also why the query time is so horrible. There's a lot of, it's all being shoved into a, the JavaScript virtual machine so the more data you put in there, the, the, the more annoyed the garbage collection gets. And then, yeah, the, the query times essentially were close to one hour. That's what, what we said. It, it, was, it works, but it's really slow. Um, it was really slow. Um, but now it's down to 20 seconds. And that's the, the demo I just gave. So 
Yeah, it still is 20 seconds, so I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, and the downloaded data uh, should have been around 9 megabytes. Uh, I try, uh, uh, tested it, doing some monkey patching in the fetch library. Um, but yeah, it should be 9 megabytes, more or less, depending on you know, specifics where, where you clicked. But uh, it's a massive difference, right? It, it went from 250 megabytes of, yeah, that's fine, I just saw it. I also have my own timer. <laughs> So yeah, in any case, it's, it's a huge improvement, right? Um, okay, that, that like more or less brings us to the conclusion, actually. Um, like going back to, to one of our first slides, is, there is like, there is an obvious benefit to sharing data, right? Because, you know, I don't have to tell you guys about sharing data, of course. Um, but but it seems like, like, a, like we don't really share the, the routing data enough yet. Like, we, like I said, we do a lot of uh, Pre-processing on the same data, but we never share the results. Even though I, I think it, sh it would make sense, like like for example, the instance of Open Trip Planner, all all its users are doing the same pre-computations as well. So, you know, why why don't they share it with themselves at least? Um, and basically, the, the, this is one of the, the the core research questions of a research group at Ghent University: is like, why don't people share data? What's what's stopping them from sharing data? Um, and in this case, I think it's mostly down to two points. First one is pretty obvious, the cost. Like, who's gonna pay for the people's thing? Who's gonna pay for, the, for, for all the effort put into it? Who's gonna pay for the hosting? Who's gonna pay for all of it? Um, well, the benefit of the, the, the techniques I just discussed is that everything is pretty, well, oh, relatively cheap at least. Linked data fragments are made to be easy to host because it's, they're all just data files. I'm hosting all of this on a digital ocean. That's costing me five euros per month. Uh, and it's only running Nginx, and it's already, you know, I have a root planner that's using the data, and it <laughs> works. Um, but of course, yes, not all it's going to be, I'm not going to be able to process the entire world, basically. Uh, so that's one of the open questions. Um, but in any case, it sh should be workable, I think, at some point. So something else that's probably less obvious is trust. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm punishing all this data, but I don't really expect any of you to immediately use this data because I don't have any published metadata to go with it. Like, I don't really specify how I used it, or, 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 or yeah, when I did it, what the, the data version was, what my algorithm did, what, like, side effects did, some of the tiles, where they all downloaded correctly and stuff. Like, you need a lot of, like, provenance metadata to actually convince people that this data that I generated is actually useful, it's actually reliable. And that, that's also, like, an open question. Like, how do you con convince people that your data is of high quality, especially if it's, like derived linked open data, it's not always very obvious where it's coming from, and it's always it's like like a bit of a black box. You kind of like make it more white. Um, yeah, and that's actually yeah, that's the conclusion of our talk. Um, yeah, our main point is yeah, serverless, well, I call it serverless now, like client-based root planning seems feasible at least. Got it down to like workable uh, performance, and the other point is of course I think we, we could share more data that's useful for a lot of people. So yeah, thank you. I, I also wanted to mention, like, what Harm was doing was fixing the worst case performance of this thing. So this 100 kilometer route is a, a huge problem, but we are already using this type of thing for pedestrian and cycling route planning. So when the routes are relatively short, the performance is, is very realistic and very doable. So it's, it, it is very usable for certain scenarios, but we know that for other use cases, it's, it's difficult, and that's yeah. the problem uh, you are working on, right? Yeah, oh. definitely. Yeah. Oh. Questions? <coughs> First one here, and then we have another one. Hi. Thank, thanks very much. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I wonder if you've seen the uh, Valhalla routing system, which is also tile-based, and what the major differences are between, between your system and their system. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's confuse with two two speakers. Uh, yeah, there, there is the difference is pretty small, but we can. Uh, I would have to guess. Ooh, this is cool. Can I? Uh, yeah, it's not gonna work. Uh, basically, the difference is that Valhalla also has like this, this hierarchical structure, right? But the thing is, they only look at the, the tags as they are, right? The, the, the top level only has like the the, the highways and the primary roads, and then there's a second level that's secondary, I guess, all the way to like residential stuff. Um, 
we do something similar, but it's, it's all dynamic. So it's actually based on how the routes, uh, the roads are actually used. So that there could be some residential streets in there if that happens to be the most uh, efficient route. So that, that's like the main difference. Yeah, the downside, of course, is this takes a lot more computation than the to, to generate than the Valhalla tiles. Um, but yeah, that's the main difference. Yeah, and I guess also the, that it's JSON LD linked data format, which is also a big difference. Ah, yeah. So also, this would also be easier to ingest for general route planning yeah. applications. Hopefully, yeah. you can of course try this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You have a question there. So, are you uh, comparing the routes you're creating, like the quality of the routes, with some of the established routing engines? I think you're talking about the performance optimizations, but what about the quality? Yeah, the, the quality should be pretty okay. Um, so yeah, we didn't really mention it, but there's like a route planning profile behind all of this, and that one is based on Osmond. So, it sh theoretically, it should do more or less the same thing as Osmond. I mean, there are small diff some differences because we're not publishing all the data. Uh, like Osmond has a elevation data as well, that's something we don't really have into our client yet. Um, but otherwise, yeah, the, the route is pretty, it's pretty okay. It's, it won't, I haven't actually tested it in real world, of course, it's just like the you know, like toy examples and see that the results make sense. But uh, yeah, it's not yeah. bad, not bad. Yeah, and we also, like, if you imagine this client-side route planning, we also have a, a, a version where we combine this with public transport. So the, 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 this combination happens on the client as well. There's no server building this model of the world and containing the whole planet's worth of public transportation data. No, you can just fetch the data you need from where you are and plan routes like that. So the idea is much bigger than just this small piece of, of the puzzle we are presenting now. It's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks for this presentation. Uh, I found it somewhat funny that at the moment that the first speaker handed over to the second, uh, his last slide mentioned data ethics and then he handed over to harm. And I was wondering yeah. what are we getting here? <laughs> uh, but that's not my question. My question yeah, is really on, right. you know, you report a system that is using pre-processed data. Yeah. So I'm sort of curious how much pre-processed data will you have uh, to what uh, level is this sensitive to your tile size uh, choices? And how will this scale if you do this for all of Europe, uh, all of other continents? Could you say something to that? that like the efficiency of generating the data or how long it takes no, to No, storage, it? storage. Ah, storage. storage. You're pre-processing, right? Yeah, so yeah, you're so paying it, somewhere. Yeah, I yeah, want yeah. to know how much you're it, paying. It's actually pretty okay because was the whole point of what we were trying to do is because, of course, the, the more data you pre-process, the larger the pre-processed data is, the more data the client would have to download. So it's something that we, we intentionally try to keep as minimal as possible. So I, I would have to check, but I think overall, it's, I've pre-processed it up until Zoom level eight, I think. And overall, I think the, the, the files, or like the, the storage size tripled in total. So that's compared to the raw data, because you have all the layers on top of that, which I think is pretty doable, at least. Yeah, at the planet, so the, the, the full planet data is about 200 gigabytes on when, yeah. we, when we have it, just when we had just the raw data, so, so, um, so like the JSON-LD output. But we, the, the, the actual rootable tile server doesn't actually store the JSON-LD, it stores the OpenStreetMap data in a much more efficient way. So. Uh, so sort of answer your question. Yeah. Also, this pre-processing, the idea is that if it takes some work to pre-process, it's not, it's not a huge problem because the whole idea is to do it basically once. So, also one of the, well, yeah. Um, I, I like the, the comment you made about trust and the question of how to build trust in this. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of um, the reason that we put routing services on the osm.org uh, right, yeah. uh, main uh, website, which is, which is partly to improve the routable data in OSM. So there's a kind of a deliberate feedback loop introduced there. And I wondered if a similar thing could help your 
uh, idea. So you have both the, the routable tiles available uh, yeah. conspicuously within the community, and that improves the routable data as well as improve as well as building yeah, trust in yeah, the tiles. The more visibility it gets, it's probably so, yeah. And something I I would really love to do is to to I mentioned the updating of these tiles, <coughs> so we want to make this update live. So it should enable for shorter routes to uh, route plan data that is being edited like two minutes ago. Currently, the problem is people edit the map and then two days later, the route planning is updated. And this could enable potentially immediate feedback on the route planning. So that's something that I think would be very useful for the OpenStreetMap website. Thanks. Other questions? Still have couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Uh, I like the idea of uh, how you pre-process the map data so other route planning applications could benefit from it. But I was wondering, uh, what if you do not want to, do, uh, to use these tiles and do this client side? But what if you wanted to do like a classic server side route planning application? Could you use the same data and the same pre-processing steps? Um, the route planner I built, Itinero, already uses the tiles because it's just easier to say to uh, projects and clients using this, like you don't have to download any OpenStreetMap data. You just set up the route planner and it's e either it starts fetching tiles when you plan the first route or you define an area and it will just fetch the data it needs. But you would have to yeah. go through the tiles. You couldn't download the whole thing once. Well, then it downloads the whole thing once and then does the regular thing the root planners do now. So basically it replaces the planet dump files. Yeah. That's what, what is what is now. But you okay. could theoretically also reuse the pre-processing logic as well. Mm -hmm. um, the, the main thing would then be to not always build an, the, 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 not an edge graph of the entire world. You always create one, one per query, basically. Yeah, but also that will scale dif difficultly because yeah. the, the, the pre-processing to make these tiles is, takes a lot of time. It takes probably more than building a regular contraction hierarchy, so it's probably not that useful. It, if, you pub mm. if you do it once and publish the data, then it becomes useful, but if you do it every time you set up a route planning system, I'm not sure if it's feasible. Yes, but for example, the pedestrian area we saw, like this pre-processing step. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that you could use, yeah. yeah. And that's what Open Trip Planner does as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So that would, that would definitely work, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other question or comment? Okay. We can close the session here. Thanks again, Ben and Harm, and thank you again for participating.